Hi there. Welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best. And for once, uh, the guy is actually little. <laughs> I mean, the first episode of this series was about a machine that was larger than a loaf of bread uh, and weighed about like 15 to 20 pounds. So calling it little guys seems kind of silly. I don't think many of the computers I've had in this series so far have been all that little. Uh, but of course, um, little is a philosophy, not a physical fact. A little guy is an x86 machine that's meant to be used as an appliance. And while a lot of them are little, that's only because it makes them easier to stuff in a corner and forget about. That's primarily what defines a little guy, being forgotten. Like, um, I, I wouldn't usually include like a point of sale terminal, for instance, because people use those all day long and you generally interact with them just like a normal PC. But stuff like this, a digital signage device, is meant to be stuck to the back of a television and nobody's supposed to even know that it exists. So anything can have the little guy nature, even if it's not little at all. But this one does happen to be little, so I'm excited to take a look at it with you. Uh, but first, I've got a note to read. Every time somebody sends me something, I, I ask, like, hey, do you want a shout out? You want me to just say, like, uh, thanks, Steve? Everyone always declines. It's weird to me. But this time I actually got a letter. This was sent to me by Violet, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't ask how to pronounce your name, uh, Regier, Regier, not sure. Uh, sorry about that, but they say, I'm excited to learn more about this little guy I've had in my possession for a few years now. As far as I know, this may have been used at the Tim Hortons on campus at Fanshawe College, London, Ontario. As for any shout outs, I'm currently working on a game for Windows. It's a 2D spear based, fast paced parkour platformer called Ooga from my studio Shedcat Games. Coming out later this year, you can find a free demo on Steam. I have not actually played that game yet, I'm afraid, but uh, I did go take a look at the store page because I wanted to know what would be spear based about a game. And and, um, you know, it, it genuinely is spear-based. I don't know what else to say. Thanks, Violet. So anyway, here's our machine. It's an EK3 media engine. And with a name like that, you could pretty much assume right off the bat that this is probably just an electronic slideshow device. And it is, but it turns out to be one with maybe, possibly, some historical significance if you care about the industry it was in, which I don't, but still. Per the back, this was, sure enough, property of Tim Horton's Advertising and Promotion Fund. So, yeah, it probably is a marketing device. Uh, but we also noticed that uh, it says it was made in Canada, probably just assembled in Canada, one would guess, uh, but specifically in London, Ontario, which is ostensibly where it was actually being used. Now, of course, it is possible for something to be sold in the same place where it was made. But all the same, uh, that feels like more than a coincidence to me. That feels more like... Um, prototype device, like they walked it down the street and uh, said, hey, uh, do you want a free advertising box? We just want to see if this thing works. And Tim Hortons just let him put it up. And that might indeed be the case, because uh, I looked this thing up and I actually found some news coverage of it in uh, Business London. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, the, the Canadian one. This is a uh, uh, like a local interest story on this company because they were based in, in that city. Uh, and right up front, it says that they were segment pioneers for narrow casting. Now, as far as I could tell, uh, narrow casting is the industry term for what I've just been calling digital signage. Uh, it seems though, like in 2006, it was a fairly new thing, which is interesting, right? Like um, the whole idea is you go to McDonald's and next to the register is a little TV that's playing a slideshow of things they'd like you to buy this week. They have a picture here, right? Coffee, $2. Wait a minute, that's, um, that's coffee and a cooler for $2.06. Canadian, for that matter. Boy, howdy, is inflation that bad? 2006, I thought that'd still be at least like five bucks. Well, anyway, we've been getting frog boiled by this kind of continuous, ever-present marketing for so long that it's actually hard to remember when it started. Now that I think about it, yeah, I guess maybe there weren't TVs hanging absolutely everywhere playing constantly changing animated advertisements at me, uh, you know, uh, 12 years ago. But boy, howdy, it's hard to remember a time when that wasn't the case. But from the description, uh, this does seem to be all they're talking about. Uh, of course, the description is extremely gross because this is marketing and marketing is uh, revolting. Narrowcasting is a seductive medium designed to educate, enlighten, and most of all, entertain. But its message arrives at what marketers call the moment of truth, or the last retail mile, when the decision to buy is made and they want you hooked. 
Unlike broadcasting, which by definition sends out messages to the mass market, narrowcasting takes dead aim at existing customers. Narrowcasting technology networks and digitizes promotional and other types of media content on a playlist, similar to an MP3 player, and streams it through an array of digital screen formats. It works best when the target audience has a break in his or her daily routine, at the bank, pumping gas, or picking up a coffee, and can be captivated by a digital screen. I, I think it's really funny that the, uh, the people who come up with marketing and advertising concepts speak about them the same way that people criticizing those concepts do. It really is a, uh, are we the baddies situation. I mean, are you supposed to read that and feel good about their product? So anyway, yeah, this is uh, basically just a digital signage box. Um, I've talked about these a couple times before, not in too much depth, but the concept is pretty shallow. It is basically just a slideshow player. You know, maybe it plays stills, maybe it plays, uh, you know, animations or videos, uh, but all it does is um, plug into a, a TV and, and play a loop, right? Most of what makes this sort of thing interesting or unique, it's just going to be the support software, um, any sort of central management, that sort of thing. And I don't know all the details about this, but I will say that um, the only info I could find about this company seemed to be from about 2006, 2007. Uh, and then apparently they got bought by a company called Cineplex in 2013 and absorbed into their digital signage department. And in the in-between, they didn't seem to make a whole lot of waves. So I, I don't know if uh, this actually was a, a prototype that um, did not make it into mass production uh, or if it was massively successful. And it's just that you can't look up info about this sort of business to business thing nearly as easily as a consumer product. So, uh, yeah, that's all I know about its history. Let's talk about the box itself. This being a digital signage appliance from 2006, everything here looks about right. Uh, for instance, we've got a VGA, but no HDMI and no DVI. HDMI was around, but it hadn't quite fully popped off yet, so you couldn't expect it on uh, any commercial display, but you could absolutely expect VGA. That was pretty much universal. Likewise, um, there's serial ports on here because commercial displays uh, could generally be controlled that way. You could tell them to uh, switch to the VGA input as soon as the software starts up uh, or you know set image settings or sometimes turn them on and off remotely. We also have RCA jacks for audio. Now, pretty much any computer made after like 1996 was going to have built-in sound. It had become pretty much free at that point, but typically you'd see a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. The presence of the RCAs uh, is what tells you this was meant to be used in some sort of commercial environment, because you'd expect to plug this into either a commercial TV that's going to have RCA inputs, or into like a PA amplifier or something like that, all of which had RCAs. And of course, you could just adapt from the headphone jack to RCA, but um, this is more likely to fit whatever cables the, the business already has. So it doesn't really mean anything. Audio is audio, but it tells you that this was a commercial appliance. But more interesting than that is the lack of keyboard and mouse ports. I would expect uh, any uh, computer from this era to have PS2 keyboard and mouse, uh, but this, in fact, just has a single USB port. So if you wanted to interact with this thing uh, locally, you would have to plug in a hub in order to get both a keyboard and a mouse. And that's probably, uh, I would guess, because this was never meant to be used uh, by anybody in person. This was meant to just be uh, deployed to a site, plugged in, and then almost certainly it would have just slurped down its instructions and media uh, over the Ethernet port. So of all of the little guys that I have, and, and certainly of the ones that I've shown on the series so far, this is the first one that is truly an appliance, I think, that was really meant to be used headless. You know, the video output was only here to plug into uh, the TV to, to be a sign. You were never supposed to look at uh, the local interface on this thing or, or interact with it. And I uh, think that's kind of fascinating. I wonder how effectively they pulled that off. Uh, or if they didn't at all. And when you turn this thing on in the morning, it boots up and, um, you know, you see a, <laughs> a desktop for a few seconds before the software loads. Well, there's a possibility that we could find out the answer to that, because this actually did come with the hard drive, and uh, it may actually have the software on it still. However, uh, I have concerns about whether this thing is actually going to turn on and work, because you see, it's rusty. There's actually rust on all the screws, front and back, and you can see uh, there's sort of some scum around the vents here. So it's possible that this thing got flooded or was just in an extremely humid environment uh, or whatever. Uh, so this could be dead for all I know. I have not tried turning it on yet. So before I can do anything with this, I'm gonna need to open it up and see uh, what the insides are like and whether it's actually safe to plug in. Uh, so I'm gonna bring up a point here. 
I've had a, a few people ask me why I don't use an electric screwdriver more often. Like I'm always just wrenching screws out by hand. Um, I actually do own one. It's the, the, the wow stick, although I think it's sold under a million different names. And I've had people recommend another one um, from, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's the sort where you, you turn to activate the motor. That's um, ergonomically miserable for me. I, I've tried that sort of thing and it just doesn't work for me. So this is the best one I've been able to find. The only other electric screwdrivers I can find that aren't like a drill from <laughs> Milwaukee uh, are quite a bit bigger than this and not really suitable for precision work. This, this is a good little precision driver, right? It takes the little tiny bits because you'd use this to take apart like a laptop. And I do use it very heavily for that sort of thing because the fasteners are always clean and, and small and, and low torque. Uh, but for a lot of stuff like this, um, I don't want to come in here with one of those great big <laughs> electric power drivers and potentially strip the screws out. And I don't want to use this guy because you never know what condition the hardware will be in, in some metal box that's been sitting in God knows what conditions for God knows how long. So I strongly suspect that if I try this on these screws, uh, yeah, it, oh, it didn't like that. It struggles a bit, doesn't it? Because as I suspected, these are rusted into the chassis, just like everything else. Let's try this one. Oh, oh, not so much. Uh. So yeah, with uh, hardware of unknown provenance, I, I usually just stick to the hand screwdriver. I would love to find something in between though that's not that weird uh, twist to activate design that everyone seems to love. So um, let me know if you have any recommendations. I'll check them out. But anyway, let's get in here. So there's a lot going on inside here. We can see more indications of rust and corrosion. Everything is uh, pretty dirty and uh, rusty here. Um, there's, there's just sort of dust and crap everywhere. This thing wasn't sealed and there's no filters or anything. And it does have at least one fan. Oh yeah, actually here's, here's another one. Oh, I had not tried rotating this before. That is in horrible condition. Those bearings are shot. This must have sounded awful in its final days. The screws holding down the hard drive are also badly corroded. Um, oh gosh, there's there's actually like um, rust crystals coming off this bolt down here. Wow. And you can see a trail of um, clear liquid residue in the bottom there. So I, like I said, I don't think this thing sat in water, but I think that it did have a lot of condensation. Oh, actually, yeah, you can see more um, precipitate uh, down in there. Also, as you can see, all the caps are blown. Now, uh, for that reason, I have not tried turning this thing on. Well, actually that and several other reasons. For instance, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not so much on the heat sink. So I, I don't know that it would that it would do very much in its current state. So we have to fix that before we can even test it. Uh, but with all these caps blown, I don't think this is going to work. Those are too close to the CPU. And um, if we take a look at how the power supply situation works here, I have the strong feeling that those are critical to voltage regulation. See, what they've done here with the power supply is the 110 volts uh, comes in here, or, or 220, it'll run on 220. So it goes into the uh, PSU and then comes out down here. We've got sort of an AT style Molex connector, but then it plugs into the motherboard with uh, just an ordinary hard drive plug. and. I'd have to check, but I'm pretty certain that's just normal four pin Molex layout. So it's gonna be uh, five volts there, 12 volts there at a pair of grounds. But um, for that reason, the 3.3 volts and any other voltages have gotta be derived on the board itself. And I have no doubt that these capacitors are a critical part of that process. So I'm gonna try firing it up anyway, just for giggles, but I'm like 95% certain that this is not going to work. I might have capacitors. I might be able to replace these, but, um, Oh wait, hang, hang on a second. Oh, well, hmm, I forgot I had that. Well, we'll have to go through that later and see if we can match those. So, okay, the probability that you'll actually see this thing running has just gone up quite a bit. Anyway though, let's uh, <laughs> get on with the disassembly uh, before I keep getting sidetracked. So let's unplug that and let's get this hard drive out of here. These screws are in such unfortunate condition, but fortunately the threads are still mostly okay. 
Now, you know, if I was thinking, I would have pulled this hard drive and imaged it uh, before I started this video. So um, I'll probably end up setting this aside and we'll see if we can uh, boot from something else. But that assumes we can even get this thing to, to fire up. Oh, um, I should mention, by the way, you, uh, you may have noticed these are some odd looking bolts. These are called shoulder bolts. And uh, the shoulder refers to this unthreaded portion here. And the function of a shoulder bolt, well, well they have a lot of functions, but um, in this case, it's to uh, suspend the drive by these, uh, these silicone things. I mean, I'm sure I don't need to explain this, but uh, yeah, that's some um, vibration reduction. That would both uh, uh, prevent vibration from, you know, coupling to the hard drive, protecting the drive, and uh, potentially make the thing a little bit quieter. Although I suspect with this uh, 40 millimeter fan back here, uh, it probably wasn't too quiet to begin with. Now, the uh, hard drive tray is kind of irritating. It's got this, this funky thing down here. I really don't know what this does. Like... It's, it's pretty much just a washer, I suppose. Okay, because these silicone things are sitting on these posts, uh, and those posts are off-the-shelf parts that are uh, just uh, universal in the assembly of uh, stamped and folded sheet metal cases, uh, you can't really get square ones, I don't think. I've never seen them anyway, um, or at least these are the most readily available. And if you put these silicone things down on top of those, they'll just punch right to the center and you know, you've know you wasted your time. So this is intriguing. I guess they didn't want to put three separate washers on there, so they just stamped, punched a single big washer for the whole thing. Huh, that is a funky way to do it. Uh, speaking of funky, it's one of my favorite things in industrial computers. 44 pin hard drive cables. Your typical hard drive uh, cable for a PC has 40 pins and they're at a, a larger pitch uh, than what's used in a laptop. The extra pins on the laptop are used for supplying power. I think it's both five and 12 volts, but I could be wrong. Uh, but typically you just don't really see these because in most applications where two and a half inch drives are used, they just plug directly into uh, the laptop motherboard itself. I would say that most experienced PC people have never seen a 44 pin hard drive ribbon. And I don't think I've ever seen one with two connectors on it. Like there's nothing that stops you from doing that. I don't think, I mean, hmm. You know, the laptop drives actually have the ability to be pinned for setting them as secondary on a single IDE chain. I've never looked into this. I suspect that they don't. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is uh, definitely a two and a half inch drive. So I've got the right document here. And uh, yeah, this little um, this little block of four pins over here. I always wondered if, if those were jumper connections or something else, because I've never seen them used for anything. I've never seen a jumper on there. But look at this, they actually do have jumper positions. And what's intriguing is they have several different ways of using them. So you can put a jumper on there horizontally for cable select. Uh, you put no jumper on there for um, a single drive mode. And then for the dual drive modes, uh, you could put one on there vertically to make the drive secondary. Or look at this. Look at this cursed configuration here. Are you all seeing this? They actually want you to put a jumper on there diagonally. I think this is a first. I don't think I've ever seen this before in any computing device. That is absolutely cursed. I am so happy that I looked this up. Imagine if I had just gone, oh, it's a laptop drive, who cares? There's nothing to learn and not bothered Googling it, right? I never would have found out about God's least loved jumper configuration. Delightful. So anyway, that means that there actually is a legitimate use for a 44-pin uh, a uh, small pitch IDE cable with uh, three connectors on there, and I would, I would love to get one of those. I'm not sure why, but I would. Oh, I just realized this hard drive's been replaced. I was thinking the um, WD Blue styling looked a bit newer than 2006, and sure enough, that's from 2010. I don't think they looked like this back then. So this thing was in service for quite some time, which makes sense given all the corrosion. Now, how do I get this thing out of here? Because it really needs a going over before I even consider trying to power it up. I guess um, all the screws gotta come out from the top. Let's get this heat sink out of here first. Ugh. Oh man, oh, whoa, that's burned? Am I seeing carbon deposits? Sure looks like it. Like this part is extremely stiff. I guess really all of it is, is much stiffer than it should be. And I can see that same sort of um uh, brown uh, gloss over it up here. Man, every part of this thing looks unfortunate. Oh, that fan, that fan's completely hosed. 
completely. I might be able to uh, open that up and clean it, but I'm doubting it. The bigger question is, did it catch fire? Because it kind of looks like it might have caught fire. There's um, there's even worse damage going on down here than I initially thought. I mean, some of it's just dirt and rust, but... Oh, man, I'm kind of afraid to plug this thing in. Well, uh, nothing to do but to do it. Let's um get these other screws out of here. Uh, where's the other screw? There's got to be another screw, right? Oh, no. Okay. It's probably just be being held in by the standoffs, actually, now that I think about it. Where are my screwdrivers? Where the hell are all my screwdrivers? Oh, and uh, as I suspected, the uh, two different colored serial ports really are because one's on the board and uh, one's on a cable. Who's surprised? All right, is that enough to get this thing out? It sure looks like it. Uh, I don't want to unscrew this USB connector, so let me get unplug that. I got to unplug this first, and boy howdy, we'll get to, to talking about that in a minute. All right, will it come out? Will it come out? Will it come out? Uh, oh, the audio's got to come out too. Uh, there's two pins sticking up here, and those point towards the ports. We'll just remember that. Now, there's not too much horror hiding below that. Nothing's worse than what we'd already seen, so it's kind of encouraging. Let's take a look at the bottom of the board, though. Now, okay, cool. I had looked this thing up and uh, found the, the manual for it, and it said that there was a CF card slot down here. I wondered if we'd get a CF card, but we didn't. Uh, the important thing, however, is... I don't see any corrosion down here, really. Uh, what do we have for RAM? This is uh, 133, blah, 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 128. Okay, so probably 128 megs of memory. That makes sense. Uh, and otherwise, um, well, here, let's, let's pull up that spec sheet because this board actually turns out to be very interesting. And if we can't get it working again, we can at least talk about uh, what a, a, an interesting little gadget it is uh, in itself. So there is actually a legible part number on here, but I didn't think it would turn much up because it looks like a code name, Wafer 7850R11EK. Well, as it turns out, it's literally just called the Wafer 7850. That's the name of this board. Um, it's made by, I'm not sure who it's made by. Um, <laughs> does this actually say? It says um, all rights reserved, but by who? Uh, here we go, uh, ICP Electronics Inc. Welcome to the Wafer 7850 Pentium 3 slash Celeron single board computer. Uh, this is a big four pin, 3.5 inches form factor board, which comes equipped with high performance Pentium 3 or economical Celeron processor with the Intel advanced chipset 815E. Now this is interesting because this machine does not come equipped with uh, the uh, high performance Pentium 3 or economical Celeron. It actually has a Via of some stripe. Now, if I recall correctly, Via was making uh, Pentium 3 compatible chips at this time that were drop-in replacements. Uh, unfortunately, this one has been so damaged we can't tell what it is. Hopefully, we'll be able to fire this thing up and query it, though, <laughs> honestly, at this point, my hopes are not high. Anyway, this product is designed for the system manufacturer, integrator, or uh, VAR, that's value-added reseller, uh, that want to provide all the performance, reliability, and quality at a reasonable price. Yeah, the, the usual pattern. Uh, it goes on to say that it provides on-chip VGA. It doesn't say which chipset it is, but it does up to 1600 by 1200, uh, and it uses uh, shared uh, main memory. So, you know, typical for the era. Now, if we scroll down here a little bit, uh, we see that it takes uh, Celeron or Pentium processors in the FCPGA package. Now, I can't remember if that's the standard package or if that's a variation, and I'll tell you why that matters in a moment. Uh, yes, that would be the Feral Cat program of Georgia. How could I forget? Wow, they really got fcpga.org. That rules. Okay, here we go. So that's just um, flip chip PGA, uh, which I'm pretty sure is basically a descriptor of every single uh, CPU with pins on the bottom, I believe. I could be wrong. The point is it's a normal like socket 370 Pentium or Celeron chip. So what makes this odd is that it doesn't have the usual socket. Typically, you'd have the little lever because uh, it would be a ZIF socket. So you can just drop the chip in. That stands for zero insertion force. And it's what we're used to. Um, but it wasn't always how it was. This is actually uh, how it was done back in the Pentium era. They didn't switch to ZIF sockets for CPUs until... Oh boy, I want to say the Pentium 3, but don't even quote me on that. The earliest ones I ever regularly saw it on were uh, the Pentium 3 era chips. 
uh, because in order to get this in here, you would just have to put both fingers on there and just reef as hard as you can. And in fact, if we take a look at their handiwork here, uh, you can see why this is a bad idea because uh, they've actually failed. The chip is not actually in there all the way. Uh, at the edges, you can see it's seated there and there, but in the middle, it's actually lifting up away from the socket. I guess um, they probably just didn't have the outline for it. Clearly, they didn't have a millimeter to spare here. And again, this is an industrial machine, so you would have bought this thing barebone, or you would have bought it with a chip already in it. And in any case, you'd only ever put a chip into this thing once in its entire lifetime. So this is not unreasonable, but um, it does suck. Anyway, getting back to brass tacks, uh, the reason that I had looked up the manual is because of this thing here. I was very confused by this thing here, and specifically by this thing here. Like, sir, may I ask what you're doing? There's absolutely nothing on this little board other than this, this little six pin gadget, which is just too small for me to make out um, the lettering on it. Uh, I don't even know if there is lettering on it. And the board indicator has been destroyed uh, partly because of uh, the position of a via. I think that says U2. So I'm pretty sure that's not just a plain like transistor or anything. I think that is some sort of integrated circuit, but uh, no idea what it does. It does seem to say ME2TSA version 2.1 in the upper left corner there, but I have no idea what that is. And I was hoping I would find out in the manual. It sure looked at first like it was plugged into an IDE header because, well, um, if we uh, put this cable <laughs> next to it, yeah, it's uh, it, it does sure seem to be an IDE connector, but you'd want pins to be sticking up if that were the case like you have over here. So I took a look in the manual and it turns out that uh, no, that's not what that is. It is actually a daughter board slot. And I looked into that a little bit and it turns out that the uh, daughter board is for the wafer 7851 uh, which adds a uh, TV output with 1024 by 768 resolution, uh, an 8-bit programmable digital I.O., uh, and uh, auto direction RS-422-485. So, yeah, that's just uh, a little little option add-on board there. But, yeah, why do they need this if that's not there? Did they... Um, did they, did they forget to terminate something? Or, or does it, like, actively tell the host system that that thing isn't there? I don't know. I don't know. Weird business. And actually, at the uh, back of the manual, we've got an appendix here about the daughter board. And it doesn't make any mention of that little gadget. So that must have been some sort of aftermarket uh, thing they did once they realized that, I, I don't know, there was some sort of problem that happened if the board wasn't installed. Uh, but at any rate, it says to just um, open the thing up and, and plug the board in. It's got some details on um, how you get access to uh, the digital I.O. It says the mapping system address is 801H. Uh, presumably, that's all the information you'd need to program this thing. Uh, but when we get down here, it actually has a little diagram showing that um, you would have hooked up the composite video output like this uh, with uh, this awful little <laughs> flying lead RCA connector. Probably not the highest quality video, right? But I found something much more interesting when I was searching for that. They have an appendix about the watchdog timer. Now, I've mentioned this in at least one or two of these videos before. A watchdog timer is basically a hardware feature that's designed to uh, let an embedded system recover from a crash. So suppose you have um, a Linux machine that's, that's built like this. You know, it's stuffed up in the corner of a building. Um, nobody can get access to it without a 40 foot ladder. And if something goes wrong with it, cause it overheats or like a cosmic ray flips a bit in memory or who knows what, you don't have time to go mess with it. You don't even have time to diagnose it. Like if your digital signage computer, uh, just hangs because of some, you know, temporary hardware failure, something got just a little bit too hot or whatever. When somebody from the restaurant calls IT and says, Hey, what do we do about this? They're not going to tell them, uh, we'll go plug in a serial terminal. We'll start doing diagnostics. No, they're going to tell them to go unplug it and plug it back in. The watchdog timer allows the computer to unplug itself and plug itself back in. But for that to work, you have to have something running in the actual software under the um, the operating system that can talk to the motherboard and tell it, hey, I'm alive every you know X number of seconds. The watchdog timer is that feature. Basically, once you turn this on, the motherboard will immediately start a countdown as soon as you power the thing on. And when that countdown expires, if it doesn't get the signal that it's expecting, it reboots the computer. 
which means that if you just turn this on and then turn on the computer, there's a good chance it's just going to sit there and reboot over and over and over every, uh, you know, 15 seconds or, or whatever. But I've never known how you actually talk to the watchdog. I just vaguely knew that you would, you know, stick a value in memory somewhere, but I didn't know where. This one tells you where. Uh, you use the BIOS function call interrupt 15H. Uh, you can use the sub function AL2 to set the watchdog timer period uh, and uh, BL to set the timeout value. How do we feed the dog? I think there's a, a t I think that's the term. Oh, here we go. Uh, the watchdog timer must be periodically refreshed by calling sub function two. So there you go. You know what? It actually has an example program. Look at that. Huh. If this thing worked, I could actually compile this program and uh, demonstrate the watchdog timer. But um, <laughs> frankly, this thing is not going to work. We know that. But we still got to give it the college try. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by testing this power supply. That's easy enough. It looks like it's not too trashed. Like, honestly, from here, it looks like it's in better condition than the computer. So I actually suspect that it, it might work just fine. So that is the 12 volt rail. Power is off. Uh, looks like there's no fuse out here, but there is one in there. You know what? Is that fuse blown? Oh, it's opaque. We can't tell. Okay. Well, let's just fire it up and find out. All right, here we go. Oh, that's not happy. I'm sorry, but was that was that 8 volts? I'm pretty sure it was. You know, I didn't notice whether the fan was trying to run. Let's um, let's do that again. Yeah, I don't, I don't see the fan making any attempt to run. Let's uh, take a look at the other rail here. Here we go again. Oh man, yeah, no. It is possible, possible that it's not coming up uh to the correct voltage just because it has no load. But to be honest, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, I think the actual issue is that it's just trashed. So let's be pragmatic. Let's set this aside. Let's get a power source we can trust. Hopefully this is not one of those ATX testers that likes to beep continuously if you don't have all the plugs plugged in. Okay, well it only beeped for a moment. Oh, it got really mad. <laughs> it looked like the uh, the pinout was correct because, well, um, neither one of the rails was the voltage it was supposed to be on that other power supply, but uh, clearly the yellow one was higher than the red. So yeah, it's obviously uh, 12 and five. And I strongly suspect that this company imagined that you'd be doing exactly what I'm doing here. Boy, I'm really expecting this thing to just let the smoke out as soon as I power it on. Okay, I'm not even gonna bother with that heat sink because that thing was just hooped. This is a VIA chip. It'll survive without a sink for some length of time. Let's just see what happens. Okay, well, it's not shorting out our power rails. That's good. I've got a power light on the computer. That's also good. Yeah, my monitor's wanting to shut off. Let me um hit this button here. Yeah, I think that's reset, not power on. What about, is our CPU? No, I can't decide. Do I think that the only real problem is those capacitors? Like. This thing has been through a pretty unpleasant time. Let's let's not beat around the bush there, right? But there's not really any specific damage to it. Nothing is 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 all that corroded. I mean, it could use a good cleaning for sure, but I think it actually survived the worst of it. I mean, we do have some rust on the board there, but I feel like there's a good chance that with just a good cleaning and maybe replacing those caps, this could work. Those are 2200 microfarad at 6.3 volts. Looks like all of them are. And that is unfortunately bigger than anything I have in this kit. And none of these look promising. I've got... Um, 1,000 microfarad, 16, 1,800, 6.3, 470, yeah, that, that will not do it. I don't know that much about um, how voltage regulators work. I'm guessing that those are part of a VRM system, and I, I don't know if they're just used for smoothing. So, yeah, I'm not sure if I can replace those with significantly smaller components. So, hmm. And, you know, 
I'm not sure it's actually worth it because I don't actually think it's a voltage regulation issue. I've done some some testing and uh, well, so if we probe out the fan header here, we find there's our 12 volts. And if we probe out the CPU, we could find, where was it? There we go, 1.5 volts. And then if we check over on whatever the hell this gadget is, okay, there's 4.8. That's a little low for the 5 volt rail, but it's still within tolerance. So I actually uh, think that the VRMs are probably working just fine. Probably there's something more insidious going on. Just for kicks, let's try just replacing the RAM. Here's some sticks. Uh, what is this? EDO. Oh, this is some weird old crap. Uh, well, whatever. If it fits, maybe it'll work. Whoa. Wait a minute. Is that getting warm? I swear I feel that CPU getting warm when it wasn't before. Oh yeah, definitely. Something's different. That's actually fairly toasty. So um, I think the RAM was bad, uh, but um, I'm still not getting anything. I guess it's possible at this point that it's trying to boot, uh, trying to post, but uh, maybe uh, issues with the stability of the power are interfering. So maybe now it's actually worth it to replace those caps. And you know, now that I'm, I'm pretty convinced that they're not playing a critical role in the VRMs, I think I'm just going to put those uh, thousand microfarads in there and see what happens. I mean, what am I going to do? Make it worse? Ooh, that came out nice and clean. Delightful. Can't tell if these leaked or if there was just additional corrosion underneath them. Guess it doesn't really matter. We gather here today to praise our savior, Paste Flux. All right, well, that's a very poorly done job, but the leads are in the correct positions and they're all facing the right way. So let's plug it in. Let me put a heat sink on that um it's <laughs> something's better than nothing right i don't know let's just try that yeah nah we'd have a picture by now all right well that's pretty much it for this thing i've tried several other attempts to get it working i reseeded the cpu i swapped the ram again um i actually tried pulling the the, the cmos battery just in case that was dead i've scrubbed it a bit more and i don't know i i think it's just toast <laughs> to use a technical term, maybe something's going on with like the corrosion down here. And if I got that cleaned up, it would, it would do better. But, um, frankly, I just don't think this is really worth the effort. Like when we're all done, it's just going to turn on and be an award BIOS. And then it's going to say, you know, non-system disc or disc error or can't find boot device. And, and that's it. I mean, well, maybe we'd find out that this still has the software on it. I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, I'm not going to put any more time into this gadget because I just don't think the juice would be worth the squeeze. Uh, because as it turns out, I said that it had a bunch of interesting stuff going on, but you know, on reevaluation, it's it's only kind of weird. I mean, this thing was strange to be sure, but now that we know that this is some sort of uh, a daughter board, that's probably I don't know ISA, PCI, or maybe just a bunch of proprietary connections um, for, you know, the onboard uh, peripherals here. So nothing too exciting there, and who knows what this does, doesn't really matter. And then otherwise, it's it's pretty much just a normal PC motherboard, just smaller, right? Like, I unplugged a USB from this uh, four-pin header here, and that's just USB with a smaller pitch. Uh, likewise, we've got a small pitch floppy drive connector here. It's still 34 pin. Uh, we've got a, a small pitch IDE connector like any laptop, um, parallel port, COM port. The same stuff as any motherboard, just um, a little bit smaller. Really, the only thing that puzzles me about this at this point is why they went with the VS CPU. Uh, now, like I said, I don't know what the specs on this thing are, but generally speaking at this time, I don't think that any of the VIA chips were competitive performance wise. Uh, with the um, the Intel chips, and that wouldn't necessarily matter because this thing probably doesn't need that much performance. But the fact that what we can see the silk screen says heatsink slash fan required means that this was putting out the same TDP as those chips, right? Now, the primary reason I'm aware of for wanting a VIA is lower power consumption and avoiding needing to put a fan on there. But since they didn't get that benefit, then I, I just 
I'm not super sure why they went with the Via. I guess one possibility is that despite the manual for this board saying that they came with a Celeron or a Pentium pre-populated, uh, maybe this company sold the boards bare bones and uh, EK3 had to source the chips themselves and maybe the Via was the, the cheapest uh, Pentium 3 compatible on the market. That would not surprise me at all, especially because again, performance would not have been terribly important. I'm guessing anyway, I guess I don't really know what the software did, right? I suppose what I could do is pull this hard drive and just try and throw it in another machine. Yeah, you know what? Just for kicks, um, let's throw it in this Dell and uh, see what happens. You know, it only just occurred to me, there's a very good possibility that uh, what will happen is the hard drive will go click, 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 because it's also been sitting in, you know, salty water from the sea or whatever it was that killed this thing. Although, now that I look at it, hmm, the hard drive seems much cleaner than the rest of the machine. Maybe they uh, swapped out the hard drive and then the machine died like three months later and then it just sat in a closet until somebody finally threw it out. All right, my fellow dentists, are you ready for that moment of tooth? Oh, wow, you absolutely cannot see what's on that laptop screen, can you? Oh, okay, Lilo boot. Yeah, yeah, that's about right for uh, for the era. Wait, no, it isn't. Hang on, Lilo? No, wasn't that out by, uh, by 2006? Wow, this is taking a minute. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I've been watching the hard drive grind away here for like 20, 30 seconds, and it just wasn't doing anything at all. I'm actually kind of surprised because um, uh, that WD Blue should be relatively fast as these things go. Uh, got some uh, some failures there. I eight ten is that um, is that the graphics? Oh, okay. Apparently that's the TCO timer driver for I eight XX chipsets. Oh right. I've actually had a couple people uh, comment and tell me about this before. <laughs> Very weird terminology, but um, TCO here actually refers to total cost of ownership, uh, which seems very weird in this context, but it is a logic block in the Intel ICH products family that I think contains a whole bunch of stuff, among them, the watchdog timer. So that uh, uh, TCO kernel module, that's the thing that's supposed to feed the dog. Now the screen has just been sitting here um, flickering to black once in a while, so I'm pretty confident that it's trying to initialize graphics, either X uh, or maybe a frame buffer driver or something, and failing due to the, uh, the different uh, graphics chip in this machine. I suppose I could restart and uh, just bring it up uh, run level one, take a peek around. Now, can I remember <laughs> how to use Lilo? It's been a hot minute. Gosh, what is it? Do you literally just say run level one or is it, uh oh. Oh, huh, it wants a password. Is that a thing? A Lilo password? Oh, wow, so it is. Well, we can fix that. Wow, that is a lot of partitions. Did they really need that many, I wonder? I guess we should probably mount those. Okay, so uh, all of those apparently mounted fine, except for the swap partition, which I, you know, I just wasn't paying attention. Uh, uh, and also SDB4, which says mount call failed, cannot allocate memory. <laughs> That's spicy. Uh, what's the format there, Kenneth? That claims to be 74 gigs extended. Hmm, not sure why that would have mattered necessarily. All right, so I've gone through the various partitions and um, they seem to contain just various sets of uh, Linux files, if you will. And I'm not gonna sit here and speculate about why that is, it's uh, over my head. However, I did discover that uh, the seventh partition contains uh, what appears to be the actual software itself. If we go over here to the uh, content folder, uh, this looks like it describes uh, two video files and where it wants them uh, on the screen and or in time. I'm not sure. They're both 1024 by 768. It looks like that's a set of X and Y coordinates for where it should appear. So presumably that would be full screen. Uh, but this one says 136 and this one says 160. So I'm guessing that's just uh, basically a playlist. And they have a couple others on here that have different files in them. So uh, most likely, I'm going to guess this was a um, essentially managed digital signage system, basically. Uh, so these were probably pushed down from some uh, 
uh, some uh, cloud service. Oh, hey, <laughs> look at this. We've actually got some spew uh, from the software itself. Uh, I don't know if this would be coming from from their custom software or if this is just the dump from like MPEG-123 or, or whatever they were using. However, uh, what's neat is we actually seem to have the media here. Let's see if we can play these. This program refuses, but I'm sure that's just Linux being useless. Let's try VLC. Oh, there we go. Looks like there's no audio associated with this video, uh, which I guess isn't all that surprising. But yeah, uh, it looks like this is just the um, the, the college was running a, a little uh, celebratory slideshow on a TV somewhere. And this is how they were doing it. And it looks like the other files in here are pretty much the same thing. Oh, and it's uh, Fanshaw College. I wasn't sure if it was Fanshaw or Farshaw earlier. Okay, and the last one was from 2007. This one's from 2008, so I guess they kept using it for a bit. Ah, uh, yeah, we got that... Uh, uh, the Ken Burns We Have at Home uh, iMovie animation effect. Excellent. All right, we also have one from 2009 and 2010, although it looks like these maybe were all authored at the same time, judging from the uh, identical visual uh, style. There's a few other files floating around uh, that suggest that maybe they uh, would have been able to pull down like dynamic uh, streaming news tickers uh, from from online and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, otherwise, looks like um, a pretty basic digital signage system, as far as I can tell. Uh, they just um, hand rolled their own Linux around it, which uh, was probably pretty common in this industry, particularly at the time. So, all right, I think we've seen everything we can possibly see about uh, this particular computer. I guess uh, my biggest question is just, um, I wonder if this thing was able to keep up with that video. Uh, those were, I think, 30 FPS, 1024 by 768. MPEG files. Um, don't know if they were MPEG-1 or MPEG-2. I'm, I'm curious now, actually. Well, thank you, VLC. MPEG-1 slash 2. That, that definitely helps. Uh, but it's 720 by 480, and this was in the mid-2000s, so I'm gonna say, yeah, almost certainly MPEG-2. Could this VIA chip actually keep up with decoding that? That's about the one question that I actually have about this, um, but uh, I guess we won't find out today. Oh well. Well, that's not exactly the video that I've been hoping to make about this thing. Uh, I'd hoped I'd be able to get it working. I'd hoped it would be a little bit more interesting than that. But um, frankly, you know, once I got the thing and opened it up and saw just how awful the, the innards looked, I figured, uh, well, <laughs> probably a bust. So uh, I suppose I should be grateful that I got anything out of it at all as far as the video goes. Hopefully you found some parts of that interesting. I have kind of a rule with these things that, um, you know, not every video is going to be the most exciting thing on the planet, right? I, I think some of the previous little guys have been pretty neat, if you ask me. But um, I figure if I sit down and take something apart and it's not just absolutely 100% nothing to write home about, if there's anything to say, then I might as well go ahead and produce the video and put it out because, you know, why not, right? It's some time on the bench. You can follow along or not. Your call, you know, it's not hurting anybody if I upload a video that's kind of boring. So at any rate, though, I hope it wasn't boring. Hope you had a good time anyway. Um, I've got a lot more of these things uh, to do, and, and I just have no idea what's going to be in them until I open them up and take a look. So, um, you know, <laughs> you're just along for the ride with me. Good luck. If you enjoyed this, though, and you're new to the channel, thanks for checking me out. Uh, remember to subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. I'm going to keep putting out videos about little guys for pretty much forever. And uh, I don't think I need to encourage anybody here, but if you have any little guys to send me, and at this point it should be pretty obvious what counts as a little guy, uh, then feel free to send me an email. It's just cathoderaydude at gmail.com. Uh, I'm collecting as many of these as possible because, well, like I said, you just never know what's going to be inside. So I am uh, very likely interested in whatever strange little gadget you have kicking around in the basement. But all the same, sometimes I have to pay for these things anyway. They show up on eBay, they show up in local thrift stores, and I just got to snap them up. And the reason I'm able to do that is because of my patrons, these folks. Uh, they're supporting me, uh, well, pretty much every way. <laughs> Not just in terms of uh, budget for, for stuff, but also for uh, my food and gas in my car and bills and rent and whatnot. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them uh, for making this possible. I would not be able to, to actually get these things done if I had to concentrate on a day job. So I really appreciate everybody um, on Patreon uh, for, for supporting me and believing in me. Thank you all so much. If you want to help me out, um, head over there and sign up yourself. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supported me already. Thank you all so much. And everyone else, thanks for watching.